Alto Ultra brings us, Dieting is the new smoking. Proud unemployment. No, pretty sure the new smoking is obesity. Everyone's arguing that it's better that you get fat. Fat celebrities are all the rage. People keep justifying being fat as being not a big deal in terms of health, as well as saying, my body, my choice. You've definitely got the parallel to the tobacco lobbyists in the form of fast food companies like McDonald's. And the products that get you fat are also designed to be as addicting as possible. Ouchie brings us, I feel better in a small body. And some people feel better when they take cocaine, but that doesn't mean it's a sustainable way of living. Vital musician. <laughs> They're saying obesity is more sustainable than a healthy weight, and comparing not eating everything in sight to an addiction? From Spizzerat. Is this calorie free as well, someone asks. Answer. Well, that depends on your personal metabolism and system. The idea of a calorie is fake. Your system responds to what your system responds to. But when they say this is sugar free, that's basically what they mean. Your body will not have a glycemic reaction to this, generally. Kitsune Milk replies, Energy does not exist. Pack it up, Tesla. Your cars run on lies. Jessica Pop, It's true. I scream lies at my Tesla, and it makes it go. Vroom, vroom! Cannabis Farmer brings something one of her friends posted. BMI is BS, so be kind to yourself. Womp womp rats, replies. The wonderful thing about social media is that it lets you discover just how stupid your friends are. From I singing, why is it totally cool to manage your emotions with a half bottle of wine, but totally <gasps> dangerous to manage emotions with food? Super bad. Nobody's saying alcohol is a good coping mechanism. Julian brings us. If doctors refused to treat people with blue eyes, blamed every health concern on their eye color, and dismissed all complaints, if insurance charges them more or denied them outright, if jobs either refused to hire them or paid them less, would their deaths be blue-related? Dusty Jazz replies, You ever heard of photosensitivity? It's a condition correlated heavily with blue or light-colored eyes. Much like type 2 diabetes and obesity. Remarkable Macadamia also replies, Oh no, this person didn't just use the blue eyes experiment, which was about racism, to justify being fat. I'm sorry, eye color and skin color are things people are born with. But, okay, let's play this out as a genetic predisposition to be fat. Blue eyes make you more sensitive to light. Lack of melanin makes you more sensitive to the sun. That means people with blue eyes should wear sunglasses to protect their eyes. People with lighter skin should wear sunblack to prevent skin cancer. It therefore follows that someone with a propensity toward obesity should watch what they eat and limit their daily calorie consumption so they don't gain so much weight that they can't leave the house. It doesn't mean letting yourself go blind or inviting skin cancer so you can set up a TikTok and whine about how oppressed you are by SPF 30. Baller B brings us. I really hope all of us are not in this battle against obesity because I actually kind of like being alive and there is no version of me who is not fat, except the dead one. Phoenix no more. Imagine being so attached to your fatness that you make it your identity, and that you would literally die without it. That is a sad existence. Medelia brings us. Even though you know it's probably not possible, do you still fantasize about having a smaller body? Gib. Alas, if only there were some way it were possible. Trying to control rage brings us. I went to the gynecologist this morning to have her tell me I've gained a lot of weight since last year and that I should do intermittent fasting. Not trying to develop another eating disorder, but thanks for your so-called professional medical advice. Proud unemployment. Why is professional medical advice in quotes? If you don't think this is a medical professional, why are you seeing her? Watch blood evaporate brings us. I feel so certain that skinny privilege isn't real. Then surely you'd have no problem becoming fat, right? Nothing would change in your life. You'd just be fatter. You can be confident that you'd be treated the same way as you always have been. In doctor's offices, on airplanes, in movie theaters, on other public spaces. 
Right. Oh, and you'd so very easily receive the medical care you need. Because doctors don't assume the cause of all your problems is your weight. Because everyone gets the same fair treatment, right? Obviously, you could afford to walk into a clothing store and find affordable, age-appropriate garments in your personal style. Because there's no difference to the accessibility of clothing depending on your size, right? You can eat whatever you want without judgment, because everyone knows that people should be able to eat without criticism. People won't make snap judgments about your health or your lifestyle just by looking at you, and you won't be denied unemployment on the basis of your weight, because everyone is treated equally on this basis, right? If all these statements are true, why are you so terrified of gaining weight? If thin privilege isn't real, why is there an entire industry that profits off the fears of people who don't want to look like me, or who are told they have to change in order to be of value? If thin privilege isn't real, why do you have a problem with being fat? Green Apple Lady replies, Okay, I'm convinced. Thin privilege is real. Just like frugal privilege, politeness privilege, or research privilege. And all those privileges are just the consequences of actions and decisions. Just like being fat is. So, it's all the same. The Lil Bell brings us. A gentle reminder that posting screenshots or in-depth details about fitness tracker stats, step counts, how long a run hike was, etc., contributes to a culture that praises compulsive movement and thinness and vilifies rest, fatness, and disability. Oak Woodland Dreams replies, Compulsive movement? Okay, that's a first for me. They must have filled up a whiteboard, trying to come up with a catchy way to say they hate exercise. Throwaway brings us. I was sending my friends some of my favorite European actresses that I sometimes look at for encouragement, and they think that Americans are genetically meant to be bigger. Uh, okay. Here's what her friend wrote. Well, you know that Europeans are genetically smaller than Americans, right? I could lose all the weight, but I'll never be as small as somebody from, say, the Netherlands. Even with all the effort in the world, their frames are naturally smaller, and we as Americans have evolved to be much more muscular with thicker bones. So we're always going to be bigger. Not trying to discourage you, but I'm just pointing that out. Bob the Orange Cat replies, Aren't Dutch people generally taller than average? They look it up. According to several sources, they are the tallest population by nationality in the world. Farahild replies, Wah, yes, spoken as a Dutch woman. We do not have smaller frames on average. We're not fat, though, but getting fatter like the rest of the Western world because we have bad cuisine. Look at our lunches, dude, and we cycle a lot. I'm always surprised by how short American people tend to be on average. From Budget Mongoose. This person's talking about when they were younger. I ate way worse then, much healthier, and smaller portion sizes. Tons of carbs, drank a lot. I danced more, walked more, but mainly I think my metabolism was faster, and I could just burn things off. Then mid-twenties, I worked in an office all the time. My metabolism slowed and thyroid started going wrong. Weight gain ensued, no matter how much I dieted, exercised, etc. Whole food, gluten-free, vegan, alcohol-free diet, so not eating all the pies. Book Hermit replies, So weird how when they stopped dancing and walking everywhere, got a desk job with more money to eat at restaurants, they gained weight. Must be ghosts. And now, Reagan Chastain. From her Instagram. Medical weight stigma is being told to exercise and eat more by a doctor who has no idea what you eat or how much you exercise. Come on, Reagan, be serious. If somebody's obese, it's obvious that they're either eating too much or moving too little. And now a couple posts about Adele. Alaska brings us. It's an article in Slate magazine. I have something to say. I'm a little bummed that Adele lost weight. Yes, I know this is not about me, but it's not just about Adele either, by Shannon Palos. Kaffi DePool replies, It is just about Adele, though. Her own weight loss is literally no one else's business or concern. I just read the article and she says, Now I have a new thought popping up when I look at Adele. I would like to be skinnier, too. She says this like it's a bad thought, like she's naughty for thinking it. Not given an FK brings us a similar one. Celebrating Adele's Weight Loss Promotes Fat Phobia and Misogyny by Deshaun L. Harrison. Proud unemployment. Misogyny? Because only women get fat? Alex, who is John Goodman? Watch Blood Evaporate brings us. 
I may be too fat for most MRI machines and have to call around to find a place that has one that'll fit me, and I'm just... Everyone is so worried about fat people's health, but they won't build medical machines to fit us. Waiting rooms consistently have chairs too small for fat people. Some medications don't work on people over a certain weight limit, and that's not even getting to the prejudice the doctors hold and how they weaponize it. Against us in humiliating and deadly ways. Just tell us you'd rather us die already instead of being so obtuse about it. Gruntled X. So medicines don't work on people over a certain weight limit. Darn those fat-phobic chemical compounds. Moxie. Those darn protons are rooted in racism. Gruntled X. Atomic weight sounds fat-phobic to me. Claw brings us. Swear people are more fearful of gaining weight during the pandemic Lovato than catching the potentially life-threatening virus. Can anyone explain the Pandemi Lovato joke? That flew way over my head. OCR Amazon replies, Most people are capable of doing two positive things for their health at once. Proud unemployment. That's too many things. It's why I can't eat vegetables after I get my flu shot. I can't count up to two. Texas Grandfather. Multitasking is based on fat phobia, transphobia, white supremacy, etc., no, this is patty cake ads. Don't forget ableism. Alto Ultra brings us. This is from an Instagram we saw two weeks ago. Yes, the people on my 600-pound life also need to nourish their bodies. Yes, restriction and dieting are harmful for them, too. Yes, HAES and intuitive eating are for them, too. No, there's not a weight limit on HAES, body trust, registered trademark, or intuitive eating. Someone replies. You're absolutely right, as it applies to people who are capable of moving around. However, there is a point where people are no longer able to move their own body weight safely. This tends to be a rare case where your body does not regulate your set point at a healthy place. I'm not talking about any person that is able to move around and enjoy any kind of exercise that they can comfortably fit into their life. I'm talking about people that have actual medical conditions in which their body does not regulate that set point, and it causes them to lose mobility. Larger bodies are not bad. And if a person's still able to enjoy their life and do what they want to do without their body breaking, this comment is absolutely not about them. I'm talking about the very few people that exist whose bodies cannot regulate their weight to the point that if they try to stand, they risk injury. Those people should not get shamed for getting surgery as statistics have shown for those individuals that it has been able to help regulate their set point, which has allowed them to regain the ability to move about and gain a bit more quality to their life. I'm not speaking about the general public. I'm just starting at this surgery does have a purpose, although it does seem overused at times because of the fat phobia in society. Kangaroo replies, I love this piece of fat logic. Don't worry, there's a set point. Your body will self-regulate. Oops, you're 600 pounds. Your body failed to regulate the set point. Don't start with moderation. It's harmful. Go to the extreme, to the point where you lose mobility and need a surgery. That must be safe. Fluffy emotion brings us. According to research, dieting is associated with every disease linked to obesity. Even obesity itself, along with diabetes, cancer, stroke, and heart disease, all likely products of weight cycling. Double signed. Reminder that a 2020 study that adjusted for whether weight loss was intentional showed that weight cycling resulting from intentional weight loss is neutral or beneficial to your health rather than harmful. Retro Treagle adds, Unintentional weight loss? So, a medical problem that makes you unable to absorb calories and nutrition is bad for you? Shocking. Common Fairy brings us, Every time I have an appointment with my psychiatrist, she always encourages a reduction in two of the eight medications I take daily. It's either incredibly coincidental or deeply rooted in anti-fatness that both of these medications have been labeled as notorious for weight gain. My bets are on the latter. Loki God of Mischief replies, I had to stop drinking some of the meds because of rash or stomach aches. There is nothing weird in reducing meds or changing them to different ones when an individual experiences side effects. Like, why would anyone want side effects? Amazing Swimming Shove it, you rash-phobic piece of poop. Dr. Cinnamon Roll. Maybe I like my insomnia? A mandarin oranges adds, 
Uh, excuse me, how dare you be sleep-phobic? Dr. Cinnamon Roll adds. Insomniaphobes like you wouldn't understand. Watch Blood Evaporate brings us. It bothers me when people talk about beauty standards and insist that skinny is the ideal because rich people can afford to hire personal trainers, dietitians, etc. And so being skinny is a sign of wealth. That doesn't really challenge fat phobia. After all, if all you need to be skinny is some extra cash, that still suggests that dieting, exercising can all make a person skinny. But we know for a fact that isn't true. The fact of the matter is that people don't become famous if they're fat. Celebrities aren't skinny because they can afford to be. They're skinny because fat people aren't employed in the entertainment industry in the first place. Hashtag not interested in debating this fat phobes will be blocked on site. Hashtag snake posts. Hashtag I talk about celebrities here rather than the rich as a whole. Hashtag because Elon Musk or whoever isn't really setting any beauty standards. Baldy replies. True, Adele, Lizzie, Rebel Wilson, etc., etc. are fat. No matter how much weight they'll lose, they'll still actually be the same weight. That's just science. Watch Blood Evaporate brings us. Dieting, Dieting is, not is not a sign, a sign of, success. of success. It's, it's a, sign a sign of woundedness. woundedness. Right, Count. It drives me up the wall when people say nonsense, but they type it in big, bold letters as though it's something deep, significant, and insightful. Okay, and a cast is a sign of a broken leg, so what if dieting is a sign of woundedness? Maybe the person felt wounded by their weight and health and decided to do something about it. Third option, maybe it's just a thing someone chose to do for their own reasons and it's really not that big of a deal? Coffee Pinewood replies, Sweating, Sweating is, is not, not angels, angels crying. crying. It's, it's blood, blood that, that wanted, wanted to be, to be horse, horse poop. poop, 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 poop. Like that? Right, Count. Whoa, you've given me a lot to think about. From Alfaba. The OP has fatty liver disease, chronic pain, skin issues, thyroid problems, and a BMI of 40+, plus, and somehow it's dieting that's the problem. Being very open and honest here, Facebook memories trigger me. Today I saw a picture of myself from seven years ago, looking much thinner than I am today. I remember that time and remember how badly I felt about my body and how hard I was working to lose weight. I'm angry. I'm angry because I can't believe that even at my smallest weight I felt so insecure and this overwhelming pressure to keep dieting and lose weight. I'm angry because that constant need to diet led me to where I am today. Much larger, with way more health problems, many of them caused by weight gain. Diets are toxic both literally and figuratively. They don't work. What they do is take a total on your body, continue to raise your set point for weight, and cause a number of health issues. They are extreme, and they have led me to an extreme health issues like liver problems, circulation issues, and increased pain. Just forgot replies. I was so unhappy with my weight at my highest weight and frustrated because I believed I had little chance in losing it and keeping it off. Now, 14 kilograms later, I'm glad I ditched fat logic and any ideas of set points or the impossibility of weight loss. The OP should try. From Entire Histories I'm so sick of thin people speaking about how diet culture is bad, but that losing weight for your health is good. I'm so thick of thin people shouting, they're not even fat when another thin person gets body shamed. I'm so sick of thin people saying, be nice to fat people because weight stigma makes them fatter. As if that's better than straight up shaming us. I'm sick of thin people speaking out against racism, homophobia, transphobia, and stuff, but not giving a poop about fat phobia. I'm sick of thin people acting like we're too stupid to know what's good for us. I'm sick of thin people thinking they're better than us because they're making the right choices, when in reality they're just lucky to have good genetics. I'm sick of being told I'm going to die at any moment unless I starve myself and lead a lifestyle that will make me miserable. Lift our voices or just shut up. Not, not a potato. I'm sick of fat people thinking I starve myself or constantly complaining about my good genetics. No, I just watch what and how I eat. I can easily gain 10 pounds on vacation. I'm sure as heck not a calorie unicorn. I'm also sure as heck not starving myself when I don't eat enough to gain 10 pounds on a vacation. From Glass in My Butt Thin Privilege is having a normal restaurant experience. 
The other day I went out to a local highly rated restaurant with some friends. The restaurant is known for essentially an American or Italian, I guess, omakase. That is where you let the chef choose what he serves you. It's typically still off the menu, but the chef will choose whatever ingredients are the best quality on that specific day and will be at a discounted price. This is usually a win for everyone. The customer gets a higher quality, cheaper meal, and the restaurant has an easier time making sure they don't overorder food. So my friends, who are all thin, and I all ordered that. I was excited to see what the chef decided to make for us, until the waitress brought it out. For the first course, one friend got a delicious looking wedge salad. One got a baked potato and cream soup. One got a bisque. What did I get? Lettuce, carrots, and vinegar. Nothing else. I felt like I was being discriminated against for my size. Hey, she's fat. She must eat too much. Let's give her lettuce and vinegar. Those are low on calories, even though you don't just permanently wait by eating fewer calories. But I decided that considering that it was only the first course, I should just wait it out and see what else he was serving us. The second course was a pasta course. One friend got ravioli. Another got gnocchi. I got spaghetti squash. Don't get me wrong. I like vegetables and eat a lot of them, but everyone prefers pasta over vegetables, and I was being denied pasta out of the chef's ignorance. Third course was the entree. Someone got a raisin pizza. Someone got chicken parm. Someone got meatballs and bread. I got baked salmon. I was seething at this point, but I'm not confrontational, so I didn't complain to the waitress. It's just not fair. I was given bad tasting food for no other reason than my weight. My friend gave me half her pizza, which convinced me to stay for the final two courses, but I was not happy. The next course was the only decent one. The waitress brought out a plate of smoked meats, cheeses, and bread. I say this was the only decent one because everyone got the same thing. Our final course, the dessert course, was the worst by far. Everyone else got pastries, cake, or gelato. I got fruit, because the fat girl must already eat enough cake, right? So we better give her fruit. Needless to say, the waitress did not get tipped, and I'm not ever going back to that restaurant. Thin privilege is being allowed to eat the food you want. Thin privilege is not having people assume you must eat too much or unhealthy food just because you're fat. Thin privilege is being allowed to have a normal restaurant experience. Chicha Chicha replies. Restaurants offer omakase, or tasting menus, because it makes things easier and it's a fun gimmick. No way the chef made four different things for each course. Or these people were supposed to share all the dishes and are just idiots. From Ms. Beaver, who loves how every slide references the same study. It's a bunch of Instagram posts. Diet culture, fat is unhealthy and will kill you. Really? Are you sure? Swipe to read the science. Assumption of being fat will make you sick, and you'll get diabetes, hypertension, etc. While it is well established that obesity is associated with increased risk of many diseases, causation is less well established. Epidemiological blah 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 blah. References a bacon study. Assumption, fat people don't live as long. Except at statistical extremes, BSMI only weakly predicts longevity. Most epidemiological studies find that people who are overweight or moderately obese live at least as long as normal weight people, and often longer. Etc., etc. Again, from the Bacon study. Assumption, if you lose weight, you'll be healthier and live longer. Most prospective observational studies suggest that weight loss increases the risk of premature death among obese individuals, even when the weight loss is intentional, blah, 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 again from the Bacon study. Assumption, the obesity epidemic is placing a huge financial burden on society. The health cost attributed to obesity in the United States is currently estimated to be $147 billion annually, and this cost estimate has been used to justify efforts at obesity treatment and prevention, but the estimate fails to account for many potentially confounding variables. Nor does it account for costs associated with the unintended consequences of positing the value of weight, focus, eating disorders, diet attempts, weight cycling, reduced self-esteem, etc., etc. Again, from the Bacon Study. Assumption, the only way for fat people to improve health is to lose weight. 
that weight loss will improve health over the long term for fat people is in fact an untested hypothesis. Bacon study. Truth, fat is not unhealthy. I'd like to point out the title of the Bacon study. Weight Science, Evaluating the Evidence for a Paradigm Shift. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time taking anything as actual science when part of its name is Evidence for a Paradigm Shift. That sounds more like politics to me. Go Kill the Lights brings us. From a supposed dietitian's Instagram comments, I hate the words calorie deficit. I get that's supposed to be the key to losing weight, but that is how the disorder begins. It's also ridiculous. Eating fewer calories just tells the body to slow down function to keep us alive. So true. Claw Panda replies, instead of thinking of it as a deficit, we should consider it only eating what we need. Puzzled Swan brings us, Anti-fatness is anti-black. Something I won't regret, one of the mods for Fat Logic writes, Fatness is anti-black. Black people suffer more from metabolic syndrome diseases and have a higher incidence of them at the same BMI. If you say that anti-fatness is anti-black, you might as well say out loud, I want more black people to suffer and die early. From Love Dove Bunny I'm honestly so sick of seeing mid-sized people taking up so much space in body positive and body neutral spaces and hashtags, especially mid-sized people who just recently became mid-sized to act like they experience the same amount of stigma, hate, and oppression as actual fat people. Sometimes even more because they don't fit into either group. Yes, you do. You're a thin person with a belly that's not concaving. That doesn't make your body marginalized. People use fat phobia to insult people in most sizes. Someone saying you're fat one time does not actually make you fat. It seems like they think that the only true thin people are like sizes 0 to 4. Kai the Devourer replies, It's kind of funny they use clothing as a metric, yet the BMI is literally Satan because bodybuilders exist. Gentle on Barry brings us, Are you sizest? You probably are, even if you don't mean to be. Here are some pointers to help you decide. You think obesity is a health concern in and of itself. I could provide so many studies that say it's not, and I'm not having another argument about this. You idolize and prioritize thinness in yourself and others. You talk about fat as a feeling rather than a material reality and use it as a pejorative. You don't consider who fits into a space or make allowances or campaign for allowances for bigger bodies. This includes clothing lines. You allow fat phobia to go unchallenged around you. Sound like you? You might be sizest. It's probably worth unpacking even if you think you're only sizest toward yourself. Our attitudes toward our own bodies bleed out into affecting other people and continue to an atmosphere of systemic fat phobia. Proud Unemployment replies. To their first point about studies. Translation, you can provide so many cherry-picked studies that don't actually say obesity is healthy, but has like one line you can take out of context to sound like obesity is healthy. About prioritizing thinness? Well, yeah. Wouldn't say idolized, but thin bodies are just objectively better in almost every way. And in the ways it's not better, the downsides don't make it worth it. About fat as a feeling, I legit have no idea what you're talking about. We refer to obesity as a disease. You guys use fat like a spiritual state of being. About not considering people who fit into a space. God forbid we don't take into account people 600 pounds and growing. At a certain point in terms of weight, it's not the responsibility of society to cater to you, and it is instead your responsibility to get to a healthier weight. About letting fat phobia go unchallenged. I only allow fat phobia that isn't actually hating on people, not your whining about doctors telling you to lose weight. Ms. Beaver brings us, More than 50 years of research proves your body tries to maintain your fat at the level at which you are designed to function best, not necessarily a size 4 or even 24. From Health at Every Size by Lindo Bacon. Can you even fathom that what's best for some people's health is to be fat? Most of the hashtags here are pretty boring, but some of them are hashtag personal trainer, hashtag fitness, hashtag fit life, hashtag fitness journey. Right count replies, I'd like to see even one decent study that says that anyone functions better at a size 26 than any smaller size. From Watch Blood Evaporate. You know, something ridiculous to me is how many things we blame on individual people 
as if it's their actions and choices that have caused their body to be a certain way. Weight, as determined by genetics, is your height. It's also determined by things like poverty and disabilities. A fat person isn't fat because they eat more than you, or somehow they did something wrong. Acne, also genetics. Some people can use every face cream in the world, but will never not have acne. Others can wash their face with only water and never have to worry about skin care. Cavities, whoa, genetics. A person doesn't choose to have their teeth not develop properly when they are four years old. You can brush your teeth three times a day and floss every day. That's not going to stop you from needing fillings. It's kind of strange, but all the things I've mentioned so far, weight, acne, and cavities, can all be improved, at least a little, with a proper diet that's high in vegetables and fruit, and low in junk. Diabetes, surprise, genetics. You don't get a disease because you eat too much sugar. You don't choose to have a disease, and you certainly don't get diabetes from being fat. Please actually look up some scientific studies. Strange, another one that's improved by diet. Thin hair? I can't believe this. Genetics! You don't choose to have thin hair. People with thin hair don't have it because they don't take care of their hair well enough. Disorders? Genetics. People don't choose to have anxiety, depression, OCD, you name it. It's not something they can choose to ignore either. Mental illnesses aren't a choice. Stop pretending like a person with OCD can just decide not to have compulsions. And you know what's even more ridiculous? The people who pretend that these things are choices know deep down that they're not. They can accept that a person is naturally thin, that someone could never gain weight even if they tried, but they refuse to acknowledge the opposite end of never not being fat. They can understand that some people never have acne problems, but somehow don't register that some people always have acne problems. They'll recognize that some people, through sheer luck, can eat as much candy as they want and never have to worry about their teeth, but then shame someone else for not taking care of their teeth enough. They'll see the fat people who don't have diabetes and the skinny people who do, but then tell others diabetes is a choice you make by choosing to be fat. They see people with curly hair, straight hair, thick hair, etc., who cannot change the way their hair naturally works for the life of them, but somehow that doesn't extend to thin hair. These people see those who naturally don't develop disorders due to genetics and then believe that this is the case for everyone. For the love of making love, stop shaming people for their natural bodies. Remarkable Macadamia replies, So, if someone is genetically predisposed to have OCD, does that mean they should never seek treatment or coping mechanisms or any help at all if it interferes with the type of life they want to have? If someone is genetically predisposed to have cavities, does that mean they just say, screw it, eat all the candy on the planet, and then never go to the dentist to have their cavities filled or attempt any type of prevention? Hair thinning may be genetic, but it also could be a sign of an underlying illness. Do you just accept it? Or do you at least have a conversation with someone to see if there are any interventions? I don't understand this defeatist stance on life. Some people don't want diabetes to be inevitable. For some people it is. But it doesn't mean sitting on your darn hands and not doing anything to help yourself or allow yourself to be helped. Everyone gets to decide what they want for themselves, but denying those who want help the opportunity to get it and lambasting them for not just accepting what happens to them is just beyond pale. Crappy stuff happens to people just living their lives, but you can take some actions to make life less crappy for yourself, or at least try. Why are these types of FAs so negative and defeatist and whiny? Watch Blood Evaporate brings us. I came across an influencer today that I've followed for a while. She typically promotes taking care of your body, being kind to it, and how thinness does not equal better. However, an article she just posted was about how much weight she had lost in six months. But it wasn't about a diet. It was about taking care of her body and how it felt. There was a before and after photo, and she was clearly thinner in the after. How often are we still sold the idea that we can heal our relationship with our body, pursue health, and that we also simultaneously still lose weight? They do not fit together. Anytime intentional weight loss or shrinking your body occurs, it's a diet. If it's a result of your pursuit of health and you still promote the weight or size loss, you're still promoting diet culture and fat phobia. Our physical appearances are not indicative of our health. If you are promoting BOPO, H-A-E-S, I-E, etc., you can't also promote your weight loss or body shrinkage. OCR Amazon replies, I hate the guess what that's a diet rhetoric. They think it's such a gotcha. They operate under the assumption that we are unaware that the way we eat is in fact called a diet or that we are as offended by the term as they are. Nope. Don't care. Call it a diet all you want. Right, Count adds. Right? That's the echo chamber, I think. 
They've talked themselves into thinking that the average person is living in dread of being called out on dieting, thinking that excess weight is bad, etc. But they don't, so it's like, fine, I'm on a diet then, so what? From Chaton Noir Calorie counting works. It's all about calories in versus calories out. You download the app, and at first it's all fun and games. It might work in the first months. Later, it slowly becomes an obsession, leading you to count calories in every bite. You hit a plateau from all the stress, and you have a new unhealthy mindset. Not seeing food, but they're calories only. It's not the food anymore. It's just the numbers for you. It leaves you completely detached from your bodily signals and your intuition. It's not worth it. Ms. Morgendorfer replies, yeah, and that's called an eating disorder, a psychological issue. It does not affect the truth of calories in versus calories out. From author Z. Suko. My roommate tried intuitive eating and gained 30 pounds. It's not guaranteed you'll lose weight with intuitive eating. We all have a set point, which is our weight within a 10 to 20 pound range. Maybe she was below her set pint and is now finally at her most healthy weight. Diets, also known any restriction, and weight cycling are very harmful to our bodies, and 95% of diets fail, and people gain the weight back within a few years. The point of intuitive eating is actually listening to your hunger cues and responding to what you need and not looking at any food as good or bad. This removes a huge stressor from your life. Stress can cause weight gain. And when you are enjoying your life instead of worrying about what you are eating, then life is more fun and free. Bigger bodies do not mean unhealthy, just like thin does not equal healthy. Proud Unemployment replies, I just imagine the CEO of Frito-Lays reading comments like this and saying, Yes, listen to what your body needs. Restricting is terrible for you. While laughing maniacally and making it rain $100 bills. And now, de-chonkers. First one comes to us from Megston. There's a picture of a big fluffy white cat sitting on a couch with his buddy, a black cat, What's a good way to exercise an arthritic chonker? Ivy Maori brings us two pictures of their white cat. I'm not going to lie, the white cat is big enough to kind of look like a pillow. Need advice to start dechonking process and reference goal weight for Dimitri. He currently weighs 24.4 pounds. From Rachu, is that one of Pikachu's buddies? It's a gray and black stripy cat with green eyes. On the first picture, he's laying on the bed looking a little chonky. And the second picture, he's sitting in a cat tree, and it says, Now she can fit in this cat tree. She couldn't before. Azula went from 14 pounds to 11 pounds after six months of hard work and eating right. From Nihilistic Table Lamp. It's a picture of an orange cat with a white belly. In the first picture, he's laying on the couch, and the second picture, he's on the bed, maybe about to attack a dog? Hard to tell. Is my 15-pound tabby needing a de-chunk? I can't tell because of all that fur. Cinema Bears brings us pictures of their gray and brown and black stripy cat. In the first picture, she looks really large. In the second picture, maybe she's lost a little. This big gal is down 8 pounds, 22 to 14, in 18 months. Must be a very fluffy cat, because he still looks slightly overweight in the second picture. No Clever Username brings us a picture of their white and black cat. He's in a picture here, eating some food out of a bowl. Mr. Squishy eating his diet food like a good boy. From Mixleia, it's a picture of a light brown lab, maybe? I don't know. It's a dog. In the first picture, he's in the water. Looks like he's at a lake, maybe hunting some fish. In the second picture, he looks a lot thinner, and he seems to have less fur, too. Looks very muscular, and he's running around on some dirt. Another update, he's buff now. Fat to fit. Trust me, it's possible. 140 pounds to a slim 97 few you brings us a picture of a very similar looking dog. In the first picture he's laying in a lake too, and in the second picture he's coming out and shaking all the water off. I'm the OP of the nine-year-old Golden Retriever Setter Bernese Mix Post. Here are some pics so you can understand better her appearance. Thank you to everyone who helps support me to make these videos, and to everybody who comes and watches. A special thanks goes out to Hannah McNally, Carl Williams, and Sarah Ahern for their generous support. That's the end of the video. If you liked it, consider clicking like and subscribe. If you really liked it, consider becoming a member. As always, there should be more Fat Logic videos every other Monday, and on the weekends I'll be looking at videos made by Fat Logicians.